Hello, and welcome back to the Thought God podcast. Our goal with this conversation is to uncover a hidden gem that can inspire others along their academic journey. Our guest today is Eddie Lee. Eddie is an international student from Hanoi, Vietnam, who was just recently accepted into the University of Pennsylvania's class of 2026, where he plans to study economics and statistics, and he is interested in the intersection between business and data science. This is a huge accomplishment for those of you that may not know University of Pennsylvania is among the top, especially for that department of economics and business. It's one of the best of the best. So we are so fortunate to have Eddie here. He's done a lot in his time coming up to college, and we're going to be talking a lot about that. He studied at UNIS, which is United Nations International School of Hanoi. Um, he was there from grades kindergarten through 12. So he's just finishing up his last year now, and he was a member of the IB program where he is a predicted 45 out of 45. I had to look what, up what that meant. I was not a part of an IB program, but 45 out of 45 is the best. It's unbelievable. Um, it's like scoring a 36 on your ACT. Um, you just don't see that. And it's probably, I don't know, it's probably more, we'll hear, we'll hear more about that later. But outside of his classes, Eddie's done a lot. He's co-founded Mad for STEM, which is a nonprofit that aims to provide students with worldwide equitable education by empowering them to pursue entrepreneurial STEM-based endeavors with awareness of sustainable social impact. He's been the vice president of UNISTEM, which aims to empower Vietnamese youth to become entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, and game developers that bring change to the world. He's facilitated weekly board meetings there, managing over 50 members. He's also founded the Economic Forum at his high school, the Digital Marketing Group at his high school, Communications Officer in Microfinance. Oh my God, the list goes on. Um, Eddie has a serious, serious passion for involving himself outside of his academics, and we're really looking forward to hearing more about it. So Eddie, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. Uh, so yeah, my name is Eddie. I'm currently a senior at the United Nations International School of Hanoi. Um, though I'm originally from Busan, South Korea, I've been living in Hanoi, Vietnam since two months old due to my parents' occupations. Um, yeah, as, as Oliver mentioned, my academic interests primarily line just economics. But outside of school, um, I love listening to music. I play a few instruments. Um, yeah, I, I like eating food and meeting new people as well. So I'm really excited to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Of course, pleasure to have you. And um, you said you like playing instruments. You're in a band as well, correct? Uh, I used to uh, <laughs> I used to be in a band until tenth grade, and I've just been playing by myself and sometimes with my friends. Um, yeah, I play the drums. Yeah, very nice, very nice. Are you? Is that something that you like to pursue on the side as well as your studies currently? Are you still working at that? For sure, but it's it's most like it's mainly a hobby, I would say. Yeah, yeah, very cool. But I love it. Well. Let's talk about you, Penn. So when did you hear that you got in? When was the big news announced to you? What was that like? Um, yeah, so I actually applied early decision. Um, yeah, and I got my results. I think it was the second week of December. I remember it was a Friday morning um, and I got mine, uh, the results or like the update 7 a.m. Uh, right before school. And uh, I actually didn't sleep at all, like, because leading up to that day, I was really, like, <laughs> nervous. Yeah, I, I, I was excited at the same time, but I just did not sleep at all. Um, yeah. And I guess it was worth it, because <laughs> I didn't get in. Um, yeah. That's awesome. That is, that's, I bet that was exhilarating. And so, yeah. what about you, Pin, made you want to apply early decision? Why did you think this is a school that, hey, I want to, because sometimes it's restrictive early action, right? Were you allowed to apply to other schools early or was it only you then? Um, I was still able to apply early to public schools. So I did apply um, early action to the University of Michigan, um, but that was it. Yeah, I'm not able to apply to any other private schools. Oh, I see. I see. What? So then what about you, Penn, stood out to you as a school that you wanted to make that early application to? I think the first, uh, I just want to preface this by saying like UPenn has been my dream school since I think freshman year. Um, but I think the reason, the reason they're fourfold. First, I think the campus, I love the campus. I've never been there physically. Um, it's urban, so it's um, like in the cities in Philly. Uh, but you can also get, I get the, you can also get the tr traditional like college experience because um, it's still, the campus is still quite big. So you get both, both of like the best of both worlds, I guess. 
And second, my location is close city. Third, liberal art, the liberal arts curriculum there, um, how Penn emphasizes it. So there, what I'm able to do is take classes from the four schools, like the College of Arts and Sciences, Wharton, um, the nursing school and the engineering school. So I can, I have a lot of flexibility as well as, as, well as freedom. So I guess explore a lot of like academic in, uh, disciplines and see what I want to work with, I guess, or major or even possibly minor in. So there's a lot of freedom in that. And lastly, I would say culture. Um, I think Penn's known for being very pre-professional um, where you're kind of expected to get internships um, like every break and whatnot. And I plan to stay in the States, although I'm not a citizen. So I kind of need that uh, pre-professional, I guess, culture um, or an environment. So I think it was really perfect for me. Definitely. No, 100%. And, you know, these are a lot of great factors. I think like it shows that you did your research when you were looking at the school, of course. Um, when did all of these decisions really make sense? I mean, you said it was your dream school freshman year. For a freshman to understand kind of the implications of everything that you just said, these four factors, um, I mean, not a lot of people even are thinking about college at that age um, or what college is the best for them because they're, you know, they don't price those factors into the equation. When did you start really saying, okay, these are the things that I'm going to need to succeed in college? Was that still your freshman year? Did you get a jump start on it? Oh, I wish, honestly, but honestly, no. Um, <laughs> I, I liked Penn. Um, I first heard of Penn because I kind of attended this like webinar at my school. Um, and there was this guy who led the uh, workshop and he was from Penn. Uh, he got his MBA from Penn, I think, from Wharton. And he was very like eloquent, like charismatic, and you know, like so I was kind of inspired and like uh yeah, I wanted to be like him in a way. And yeah, that kind of was the beginning. And I think what I actually wasn't planning to go to the States until beginning of eleventh grade because it is quite costly. Um my parents would have preferred me to go to Korea. Um so like one day, I guess, gave me the green light. That's when I really started to like research because um I don't want to put my parents like money to waste and it's so i think i think it just also made sense like you're spending your four four years there um why not like like research a lot and really choose the right school for you definitely yeah no 100 percent. i think that's great i think especially with the parents and and if they're the ones financing it you really have to make that you have to sell them you have to say this is why you're spending this money yeah when i was first going to berkeley it was like they made it was like a test it was like what are you really going to do here? I thought, oh my yeah. God, what do you mean? What am I going to do here? Why are you even testing me? Um, but no, it's, it's important. And so you're going to go there. You're going to study econ and statistics. Now, how committed are you to that path? What does that look like for you? Are there any other degrees that you're considering? I know you want to take a lot of different classes from different schools, but. Um, as of now, I am pretty set on studying economics and like in conjunction with, I guess, data science and statistics. Um, but I never know, honestly. I do plan to take a few comp sci classes um, mm -hmm. because there are a lot of options for a dual degree, um, an uncoordinated dual degree where I can, can uh, study economics and computer science. I think that is actually quite a, a popular like choice. Uh, and a lot of uh, students there at Penn, uh, from what I've seen and heard, um, yeah, but I'm pretty sad on studying econ as of now. Um, but I'm definitely open to options for like possible second majors or minors such as computer science. Um, so yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think that's, you know, it, you never know what you really like until you get on campus and take a class and you're like, oh, wait, that's, that's pretty neat. So I, I think you're going to come up with something great there. Um, and, you know, what, what inspired you to learn more to want to learn more about this intersection of business and data science? When did you start to feel like this was a viable path for you? Mm. Uh, I think um, my initial, I guess, like affinity, to, affinity towards interse intersection or like realization was, I watched this TED talk by, um, by Hans Rosling. I'm not, I don't, I think he's, I, I would like to say he's a data scientist, but he um, created, he spearheaded this, um, website and tool called the Gapminder, where you can test out like variables like um, life expectancy, like GDP, and like see the relationship of like all countries around the world. Um, and he also had a Dollar Street, where um, you have the like GDP per capita around the world. So like a family who earns like seven dollars per month, like on this on the far end, and then 
who earns a lot on this end. And you, you're able to see the conditions where they live in and whatnot. And that kind of aspect of, I guess, business where the human element, where you're able to see where they live, like the conditions and um, the numbers where you can see like the relationship between certain variables and whatnot, that made a lot of sense. Um, because I think oftentimes, um, like though data is very integral right now, um, it kind of shadows like the human element sometimes, which is, I guess, I think is equally important. So I think business brings out the human element and yeah, data science is a number. So I thought that was like a perfect combination, I guess. Yeah, no, I think that's really cool. I think that's, I mean, there's, there's a lot to explore there. Um, <laughs> so much to explore there. You're gonna have a lot of fun studying that. And, uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how the path progresses. I really am. And, you know, to see how you engage in, in the mm -hmm. campus and everything like that, I think you're going to do, you're going to do wonderful. You're going to love it. So let's talk about your pre-college program. So you attended Columbia and was mm -hmm. this a summer? Was this a summer program where you did the Columbia pro, uh, yep. program? Yeah. Summer program. Okay. And so the title of this program was Globalization Challenges in International Economics. So yeah. engaged and delved into the intersection of economics and politics through relevant case studies. And you learned and examined the interplay between globalizing pressures and national interests. So what year of high school did you do this during the summer? Going into what year? This was last year, 2021. So um, like the, the summer break leading up to my uh, senior year. So oh, it was quite late. Um, yeah, but I decided on the program. First, to be honest, I didn't have that many options. I think I applied like May or like April, which is quite late. Um, I think a lot of the more well-known summer programs like Launch X and like Yale Young Global Scholars, but the results already came out by then. Um, but I chose it because my interest uh, at the time was really like in development, uh, like developmental economics, which is, I guess, like a brewer combination of politics and economics. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually did a lot of... Um, I do take a politics a class for in the IB program. Um, I I um, also wrote a politics based essay um, for one of the competitions that I uh, participated in. So I did have a interest in politics, and um, I thought this was a perfect course uh, to I guess learn more about this kind of inextricable relationship between politics and economics. And yeah, and also I was uh, doing uh, conducting my trying to conduct my own research. I did a publish a research paper that I independently like wrote. And that was kind of about, um, that was also like a mix of politics and economics where I was looking into how did the gentrification of South Koreans um, affects like Vietnam and its econo like economy as well as its growth and development in the long term. Um, so that was also very helpful. Like the course is very helpful towards that um, paper as well, writing that paper. Definitely. Well, I want to touch more on that paper. Um because I think that's super interesting. That's a, that's a part of the world that I could definitely learn more about. Um, what did you end up finding from that paper? What were your results and, and kind of what was the synopsis in a 3000 foot view? Um, so yeah, uh, I had to consult a lot of data in regards to like demographic trends, um, like a current account, like the exports and imports, like the really, the, I guess the bilateral relationship between South Korea and Vietnam specifically. Um, and I looked into metrics such as like foreign direct investment um, and other metrics. Um, I think what I learned about, uh, learned through my, uh, like a synopsis is the kind of double edged nature of this kind of emphasis on just sheer economic growth, which is what Vietnam has been kind of doing. They've grown a lot. Um, I think that's just und like um, undisputed, like that's just a fact, but like behind that growth is kind of like be behind that growth what happens is then uh, vietnam has been sacrificing like sovereignty and that um the presence of a lot of these south koreans as well as like huge multinational corporations such as samsung means that you lose self-sufficiency um mm -hmm. in the long term and i guess control as well so i would look that in in i guess the long-term lens and kind of evaluated that um yeah in my paper very cool that's really interesting is there a way that people could read that paper if they wanted to learn more about it um it's, I only have the abstract published in the journal um, that I submitted it to, but I can definitely um, share it with anyone who's interested. Uh, I can share it with you after this podcast. Yeah, 100%. 100%. So that summer program helped you write that paper, which is really interesting. Um, did that summer program help you realize that Columbia was not the school for you? Um, or did you still apply to Columbia? Uh, 
Columbia was, I, I'm only allowed to apply to 10 schools. Columbia was actually not on my list. Um, I just chose, I just chose a course because I really, I thought the course and the content and whatnot, which was just perfect for what I was like interested in at the time. Um, uh, but yeah, I honestly, I did look at like pen courses, summer programs, but none of them like really piqued my interest. So I think, yeah, I think I just chose Columbia one. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, good deal. Well, let's go into your time at high school more now and talk about you were responsible for founding a lot of different organizations. Yeah. Um, so we like a lot. I was like, good Lord. Um, so let's talk about these clubs first. Economics Forum, digital marketing. You can talk about them separately, but you know, what does it take to set up a club at your high school? What were kind of the efforts and the hurdles that you needed to spearhead and what were your biggest sort of learnings from this um setting up the club itself is um quite easy at my school um you just basically submit a form like a google form to like the student government and you just need um yeah but that's the, so setting up the club itself getting it started is quite easy but i guess maintaining it um is really hard is what i found from with from my experience in high school um, so like it's really about finding the right people, um, like people you can trust and the people you can actually work with. Um, yeah, there's a lot of time commitment that goes into it. You need you need to be a good leader. Honestly, I wasn't the best leader in the beginning. Um, you need a lot of patience as well. Um, yes. So what I learned is, I guess at large is like an organization is very like people driven, um, and that the trickle down approach does not work. So by that I mean, um, like what I did initially was. I worked really hard with my other co-founder and expected um, like the club members, I guess, emulate that or learn from that. Mm -hmm. Like I hope, I hope it's trickled, trickled down, but I never worked. Um, I would say a bottom two up approach worked more where you directly work like on your ground with your members and kind of, I guess, establish this kind of cult, like work culture or group culture that you want. Um, and that worked for me for all my other like ventures and clubs. Yeah. I think that's a really impactful thing to share. Um, so people don't have to run through that issue and just run the work. <laughs> that's awesome that you're able to kind of face those failures. So what is the economics forum? What is this club? What do you guys do? Um, yeah, so I'll, I guess I'll talk about both. Um, I think both clubs kind of, I founded the economic, Unis economic forum after a digital marketing. Um, and I think they're kind of parallel to my interests. First, beginning of junior year, I was really into marketing. Um, like this, I had some experience in design from like middle school and like high school. Um, so I wanted to do marketing related stuff. Um, so I founded that club because um, there was no like marketing club. I've seen that a lot of clubs, they have uh, like they, you know, make Instagram accounts, uh, like platforms and advertise whatever they're doing. Um, but they do it like, like internally. And um I thought there was a need or perhaps there could be benefit and utility if there's like, if they can kind of outsource that, outsource that and have like a partner where they, we kind of provide like a marketing firm, uh, yeah. where we provide these materials if they need. Um, yeah. And so that's essentially what we did. We were basically a marketing firm for just other school clubs and service groups and whatnot. A Unis economic forum is we, what we did is we just essentially created a platform um, and we just write articles um, on just contemporary events. It's very, honestly, not too unique, but um, yeah, like there's, we have a editorial, a, like letter, like school newspaper. Um, there, there's nothing related to like economics or politics. And I kind of wanted to bring that in um, for this club. Oh, that's awesome. So you're able to explore those passions that you had outside of your curriculum and kind of build those opportunities for yourself, which I think is a huge lesson in and of its in and of itself to the students, um, you know, just because your school doesn't have the class, you can still go and make the opportunity. Yeah, for sure, yeah. What do you recommend to the students out there that are considering starting a club? Obviously this ground up approach is one, but what are some other insights that you think you can share for people that are really looking to dive into something they're passionate about? Um, yeah, I think for, I think most importantly, like passion is important. Um, to be honest, my passion for marketing did die off. And I think the club kind of died off towards the end, if I'm being honest, um, which is always like obviously my fault. But yeah, I think the passion really needs to be there first. Um, well, for a second, um, 
like going back to the kind of balance between like the human element and numbers, what I learned from Unistem, which evolved into um, like Mad for STEM, is you should never emph emph uh, like, uh, emphasize or underscore like just club member numbers. Like um, my school is pretty small. I think we have 80 people per grade. And Unistem, we had like around 50 plus members. So we were the biggest school club, but it was very dysfunctional. Like we had no like club, like group identity. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't functioning well. Like their attendances were like very like sporadic. Um, yeah, so that's because we just wanted to, we just wanted more members. We thought that meant success, uh, but yeah. that's not true. Like what's really important is functionality, or, like cohesivity, like group identity and whatnot and transparency as well. And that's, yeah, so in the end, we decided to, like, cut off a whole branch, like, and that actually really helped us. So it's, it's not about numbers. It's really about, I guess, it's not just about numbers is what I want to say. You no, know? 100%. I have a, such a similar experience when I was in high school. Um, well, I became, well, I started freshman year, somebody had recruited me to this club, and it was a service club. So you'd give back, you do volunteer you know opportunities and fundraising etc and when i joined i think there were four kids in there total mm -hmm. and so not a lot of people and then i ended up becoming president because all the people above me were uh graduating mm -hmm. so i think as a sophomore i became a president and i ended up growing the club to you know upwards of 100 kids which is just around a fourth of the school and wow. but i i didn't do it from the sense of like hey let's get behind what we're doing i was like we offer free pizza and we get a missed class time to do these service events. <laughs> like yeah. that was a motivating factor. Um, and you could kind of tell like people didn't take it serious during meetings. Attendance, like you said, sporadic during meetings. Yeah. Um, but I think that's a great lesson. I think your takeaway there is huge. It's, it's really about the identity, what you're trying to accomplish. And it's not so much about the numbers. It's about the, yeah. about the you know, what you can achieve. So um, I love that. I think that's super relatable to me as well. So tell us about Mad for STEM because this is the next, this is the next spot here. Um, yeah. So Unistem evolved into Mad for STEM. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what what is this? It's it's obviously providing a lot of opportunities to teach kids about entrepreneurial efforts in the field of STEM with a social impact involved. So how did this all come together? How did you guys re realize this is what you wanted to do? You were the founder, right? Co-founder. Co-founder. Yep. Um, so I personally, um, we have four co-founders. Um, they're all my friends. Um, two are seniors, one's a junior right now. Um, and what we collectively kind of recognize is that there's a huge discrepancy in like the quality as well as um, like type of education that you that students get like locally here in Vietnam. Um, mm -hmm. Where yeah, we're very to be honest, like to be blunt, I'm quite privileged. Uh, I've been. On, on, I think unit like my school is known for being the like best school in our city, in my city, um, where you know I get access to all these resources, opportunities. But in the I have also have, I also have a lot of friends who go to like uh, public schools or like give to schools, um, and it's very uh, like conventional. Like their education is like um, like just test taking and whatnot. It's just really conventional um, education. And where there's no emphasis on like interdisciplinary learning, where I don't know, like you combine politics and economics, it's just like it's all separated. Um, and also STEM is not as accessible from what I heard. So we kind of wanted to, I guess, bridge this gap, kind of be the mediator and bring in a lot more opportunities and yeah, help, I guess, students, yeah, like pursue more projects that are STEM based and whatnot. Yeah. And this is, and so you guys help, you serve people outside of your high school, you serve people within the community. Um, initially, yeah, Unistub was just at our school. Mm -hmm. um, but now what we're hoping to do is kind of branch this out into uh, other local schools in Vietnam and possibly and potentially uh, establish other chapters um, with the same system. Because uh, I guess uh, we did have a lot of traction um, in our school and the system worked in our school. So we're hoping that it'll work as well um, in other schools or and whatnot. Um, so yeah, that's the long-term plan. That's awesome. No, I love that. That's that's you know, it's like you find a problem and you say, no, I want to I want to fix this. Why do you think that problem stood out to you in particular? This idea that uh, you know there needs to be a, a more cross-disciplinary approach to how students should be learning and interacting. Um, you know, that's something that 
a lot of students can say, huh, whatever, you know, I'm just going to float past that. Why did that stick out to you? Like, no, I need to, I need to address this. I think it's personally because first I recognized the value as well as like the meaning um, of kind of like this inter interdisciplinary learning uh, through my like ventures or like my research projects um, and just what I do outside of school mostly. Um, and I wanted other people to see the value in this kind of like interdisciplinary learning as well. And yeah, another, I don't think I've mentioned this, but like this course, the students um, in our club, uh, what they do is like, um, they'd have projects at the end after they go through a curriculum. So we also wanted to emphasize like project-based learning instead of like test taking and whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it was more like personally, um, yeah, I would say because I kind of recognize that value and I wanted other people to know about it as well. Definitely. Yeah, no, that's just, that's great for you to do that. Um, a lot of people, they'll start a club or join a club or get a position just to kind of say like to that college that they're eventually applying to, hey, like, look at, look at me, look what I've done. Um, yeah. I mean, I joined band my senior year. Like uh, I hadn't picked up an instrument since I was like <laughs> pre-middle school joined band to show that I was well-rounded so I'm, oh. I'm no better than anybody but for you to do this um and for you to dig into something that you found impactful for yourself you know a type of learning that you were like you said you wrote an independent research paper on the intersection of politics and economics like for you to share that type of thinking with others and to see that traction I, that just must feel so rewarding that's awesome for you mm -hmm. <laughs> super cool well hey Eddie we're gonna take a quick break really quickly and we're going to jump right back into this. Mm -hmm. All right. So we were just talking about Eddie's experience setting up the Mad for STEM group, what he plans to do in the future, how he hopes that someday there'll be, someday there'll be more chapters um, because their system seems to be working, which is super cool. Um, super cool for him to dig into his passion and really cool to learn more about what he hopes to accomplish um, in this field. So... Eddie, we're going to close this out with a rapid fire round. Um, we're going to ask you these questions here. And the first one is, what is your favorite book? I would think again by Adam Grant. Uh, I'm not sure if you heard of it, but it's really about um, the, the value of being able to earn, like unlearn um, and kind of rethink uh, and apply, apply them into like unf unfamiliar situations and whatnot. Um, yeah. It's probably my favorite book. I'm reading Very it. Very cool. Now. Very cool. Most of, would you say that that's something that's impacted you a lot? For sure. I think it impacted a lot of my, like, honestly, work philosophy. Um, like, um, yeah, like, it's, I, I guess, tell this a lot to a lot of my, like, I use this philosophy. Uh, I got, like, what I learned from this book and a lot of my, like, clubs, especially for math or STEM. Um, because I think if you don't, like, rethink, you become stagnant um, and kind of like bounded by like your, I guess, previous like like predispositions, your like previous beliefs and whatnot. You become kind of narrow minded and yeah, like it's just it's just not good for everyone else in the club. Um, you become stagnant. Like, so I think that's something really important, like being able to rethink. Like, Definitely. No, I love that. Um, so who is your favorite teacher and what grade was that in? Um. Probably, her name was Miss Tina Carew. She was in fifth grade. Um, she was, uh, I don't know if this is the best word, but she was kind of like a tomboy. And okay. She was in, like military exercise, like almost military exercises in fifth grade. Um, she was very blunt, but it was really funny. And yeah, she was my favorite teacher, probably. I love that. Very good. Um, and what is your favorite thing about uh, you and IS? What do you think your favorite part about your school was? Um, as cliche as it sounds, the people, like the community, I've been part of this community for basically my whole life now, like 14, 14 years. Um, I still have teachers who I've learned from since kindergarten, um, and kind of seeing them and, uh, yeah, I guess growing, kind of having them in my journey is some kind of meaningful and valuable. Definitely. And what do you look forward to most at Penn? Uh, is getting out of Vietnam and Hanoi. I've been here for too long. Um, <laughs> I, I love it. 
I love it. They'll be fun to do explore out there. And next question, what is the most stressful part of being a student day in and day out? Um, there's balance. Um, there's balance between social life and academic life. Definitely, definitely. And who is the favorite person you've ever liked to study with? Probably my girlfriend. <laughs> Shout out to the girlfriend. The last person I spoke with said it was her, said it was her boyfriend. So there, oh. I see a theme here coming. Um, I love it. So this next question is a great one. What is your biggest hope to accomplish during your time on Earth? Mm. I don't know if this is a great answer, but I just want to spend a lot of time like with my family. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's family's really important to me. So. That's a great answer. No, it's a, it's a really great answer. The cool part about that question is, is, um, it kind of lets you see like how people feel about their, like, what's their perception of the world. The, one thing that I've just noticed over time and people asking is like, you, you talk about somebody academically an entire conversation, and then you ask mm -hmm. them a question like that. And it, it's more humble. It's more to the heart. And I think that's, that's beautiful. I mean, it's a great answer. I, yeah, no, I love it. So what is your top piece of advice for those who are early in their educational journey? Early in their educational journey? Um, try out anything you want. Um, yeah, so don't be discouraged, uh, especially in regards to like extracurricular activities too. I'm, I have no, like... I'm not good at any like STEM subjects. I despise STEM subjects. Um, <laughs> though I though I do like uh like data and whatnot, um, like chemistry, biology, like just straight up coding, I kind of dislike, but I still I guess kind of found it and joined like a STEM organization. And you can still you don't have to like direct know, like be like adept or like I guess knowledgeable about the subjects. You can be like be in charge of the operations, I guess, and still kind of learn uh, from the people there. Um, so don't be discouraged, try out a lot of things. And as for applications, do not, um, this is very personal, but do not, I hope anyone does not like emphasize just prestige. Low prestige is important. I think it's really uh, the most important, most like paramount is to do school research, like find the right school for you. Um, I have a lot of friends who, yeah, just all they care about is prestige. Um, and I think that could hurt you in the long run. Um, yeah. Definitely. No, I, I think it's, it's this recipe for burnout. What would you say, you know, finding the right school for you, what does that mean? How would a student go about doing that? Because, heck, I mean, college is a whole new environment. That's true. Um, what I personally did is um, I went on LinkedIn um, and I found people uh, from the schools that I like or that I really wanted to attend or like, I guess, my top choices. And I talk, like, had short calls with them, if possible, and asked them about um, like the student culture there, like, uh, like how the campus is, and like you know, like it's questions like that. And I think it, it really varies per person. Um, for me, I think like the culture, like pre-professional culture, was something I was looking for. It might not be the same for others. Um, uh, but yeah, like look into like aspects such as like I don't know, yeah. So student culture, like location. Uh, like their curriculum, I guess, if it's more liberal arts based, if they're more like STEM based, there's a lot of factors and it's important to lay them out first and then do your research, I guess, like school research. No, I love that. I think that's great advice. And Eddie, where can people follow what you're doing, keep up with your path? What's a good way for them to connect with you? LinkedIn for sure. Um, LinkedIn for sure. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well, this has been such a pleasure. I'm super glad we had the chance to chat. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what you do. This is exciting. And congratulations again on getting into Penn. You're going to do wonderful things over there. Thank you so much. Of course.